My name is Ingrid Jean-Baptiste. I'm the founder and director of the Chelsea Film Festival in New York City. And tonight, uh, because again, it is an unusual night, we have the pleasure to have a different way of introducing uh, the night. We've uh, had also today the opening night film Q&A that was earlier today. And tonight is going to be a, a presentation of our jury members about a very specific uh, matter and subject that we decided to choose because uh, our world is different. So let's see what our jury members say about what they're living through right now. And before we do that, I would like to thank a lot of people because I'm not doing this by myself. Um, I am really honored to introduce the list of sponsors that have been supporting our festival for many years now and specifically this year, which has been a very uh, interesting and challenging year to say the least. And the first uh, person I'd like to thank is Gail Brewer's office, the Manhattan Borough President's office, uh, the city council member, Corey Johnson, the French embassy in New York City, the Ministry of Overseas in Paris, and also the mayor's office of media and entertainment uh, in New York City. Our signature partners include the MasterCard, the Sierra Club, JC, Deco, the Marmara Hotel. And you are watching today the live stream on Film Festival Plus, which is a brand new platform. And we're really honored to work with um, Helmut Kuhn, who is, has been a wonderful partner to host our virtual platform. So thank you, Helmut, for being behind the scene and helping us through this. Uh, IDNYC, Final Draft, and our media partners, Black Film and TV, Le Petit Journal, Point Com, and Indie Activity. And of course, uh, there are also um, members of my team, uh, my husband, Michael Rutolo, my mother, Sonia Jean-Baptiste, who's the co-founder, Milena Maxe and Danielle Londono, our production coordinators, and all the wonderful volunteers that have been supporting us uh, through this year. And without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome our distinguished guest, our jury. They've been uh, really amazing uh, watching all these films and taking the time. As you all know, we're busier than ever on Zoom. So it's another Zoom today again, but to, to speak about uh, something hopefully meaningful and important for, um, for the world. And I'd like to introduce Kiki Lemden Stout. She is our moderator for this evening. She is my dear friend. Uh, she's the CEO and uh, also founder of the production company called Mudcat Films. She's joining us from Austin, Texas. Uh, we also have LA in the room and uh, LA and Texas, <laughs> LA and Texas. So Kiki is uh, also uh, the actor's um, studio member, an actor studio member and a screenwriter. She had films uh, selected in many film festivals, including uh, Tribeca Film Festival and Newport <laughs> Beach Film Festival. And I'd like to... Um, Take it over to Kiki now, turning over to Kiki. Thank you. Hi, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, this is my, I think, sixth year with the Chelsea Film Festival. And it's always an honor to be involved. I've watched Ingrid and Sonia grow this festival. And the one thing that a lot of the filmmakers have said over the years is that it feels like a family. And they feel like once they've screened their film here, they feel like they're inducted into this long reaching family. And usually this film festival is held in Chelsea, the neighborhood in Manhattan. And now more than ever, this family now feels like it's extended and worldwide as we go virtual tonight. Um, I sit here with the jury. They're all accomplished artists in their own right. The, their bios I will not go through because they are so long <laughs> due to all of their accomplishments. But tonight I really feel honored to lead the discussion in talking about 
social injustice in the world and how filmmakers and artists are approaching it, how our world has changed and what we are going to be looking towards the future as if we had a crystal ball. And if that future, how we might predict how it's going to change and things that we are hoping we might have an effect over right now to kind of take a bit of, I would say not control, but maybe shape that future as filmmakers. So I'd like to introduce to you, Paul Calderon, who is this year's president of the jury. And he's also a former, and I believe still a board member of the Chelsea Film Festival. Mm -hmm. Paul. Hi everyone. Um, about 10 years ago, I believe I had uh, coffee with uh, Ingrid and she had told me about an idea that she had about a film festival. And I'm so happy that she grabbed the bull by the horns and went forward with that because it was just an idea that she had. And I would say the first year, second year, along with Sonia, and it's just been a beautiful thing watching her grow uh, as an artist, uh, as a producer, as a woman, and the festival as well. Watching it grow and giving a voice to a lot of filmmakers that otherwise wouldn't have been able to um, voice their work. And I want to thank everyone here, because I know that everyone is taking time off from important things to be here. This is also an important function, but it's a crazy time right now. And um, feel fortunate and, and I also feel happy to be here. So thank you all and I'll send it back to Kiki. So tonight we're talking on this big umbrella about social injustice. And I feel like it's always been there. It's always looming, no matter where you are in the world. It's something that touches us all, whether directly or indirectly. And as filmmakers, as storytellers, we get to address it in a very special and specific way. And that's through our storytelling. And the Chelsea Film Festival's motto is always to make the world a better place. So as I start tonight's conversation and we have, how, Ingrid, how many films now are screening at the Chelsea Film Festival due to the virtual platform? The silver lining is how many? 130 <laughs> films from 18 countries. That's pretty amazing. 130 films across the globe from 18 countries. And as Chelsea Film Festival has always had a focus on first time filmmakers, filmmakers that, like Paul said, um, it's given them a platform and a voice to tell stories that at the essence is going to make the world a better place. And so tonight, I'd like to segue into that, into our jury uh, members, their experience watching these films and their own unique experiences as individuals, as individual artists. If you look at this jury, you know, I'm really amazed at the things uh, my great grandmother was an enrolled member of the Chickasaw tribe. Um, my other great grandmother was not an enrolled member, but she was also part of the Osage Nation. So I'm looking at Heather Ray and the things that she's doing for indigenous filmmakers is remarkable. And the things that Paul has been involved with in theater and TV and film, um, being someone of Latin, descent, you know, born in Puerto Rico, moved to New York. He's a fascinating person, aside from his acting, um, unorthodox, you know, it was such an amazing show on Netflix that you um, were a consultant on. And so, Mr. Rosen, I'd like to talk about that. And Robin, you've played Calamity Jane. You've had some really amazing roles that have given voices and platforms to women that we don't normally see. We don't really get the opportunity to see. And, and Taryn, the same goes with you, Orange is the New Black. 
And so I'd like to focus on all of your work and then how it relates to the bigger picture. So as we're moving forward into this strange territory, um, you know, there's so much, at least in the United States right now, we're dealing with a climate. Um, we are politically divided, spiritually divided. Um, but tonight we can come together, um, whether you be in the United States or wherever you are in the globe and celebrate filmmaking. So I would like to start. And as I mentioned, Heather, you know, of course, being of Native American descent, and it's especially close to my heart, um, the lack of representation um, that we see in this country. Um, you know, Native Americans are almost virtually absent from culture, um, you know, especially in the movies and on TV. So if you'd like to take a moment and talk about what you're doing and how you're kind of moving that discourse forward, we'll kick it off that way. Thank you, Kiki, so much. Um, <clears throat> well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I, I just wanna say thank you to my fellow jurors. It's been wonderful to be with you in this process. And I certainly want to acknowledge the filmmakers for their hard work. It's, it's a miracle to make a movie. And I've made a few and I know that it's, 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 it's I would liken it to moving a mountain. Um, <laughs> so I acknowledge all of the filmmakers whose films are in the film festival. And to Ingrid and to her mother, Sonia, thank you so much for what you've done to create this space for artists to come together and, and to show their, show their works. It's, you know, it's such a valuable, and it's such a valuable resource and a part of our industry that I think has just managed to be so resilient in the face of this year and everything we faced. So I really want to acknowledge, you know, you all as a festival and all film festivals that have just found a way to make it work, you know. Um, I'm zooming in from Los Angeles, so I certainly want to acknowledge the land that I live on, which is I'm in the valley, the San Fernando Valley, and this is the traditional territory of the Fernandeño Tatabium peoples. And broader Los Angeles is the territory of the Tongva, Kitsch, and Chumash peoples. And of course, New York, the Delaware and Lenape peoples. And so I, I certainly wanna be an acknowledge of the original people of the lands that we're all zooming in from, most of which is unseated, particularly in America's cities. Um, and I think that we're in such an interesting time. There's such a reckoning that we're experiencing right now in this country. Uh, but I also feel that it's a reckoning that needs to happen. You know, this country is built on a foundation of genocide and slavery and it's oftentimes what I refer to as a house that's built on a foundation with no integrity. And without integrity, nothing works. It's, if you think about structural integrity and architectural terms, you know, it's really, you, you cannot build on a weak foundation. And this country is built on a really challenged foundation. And so I, I look at these times and I feel like, you know, quite honestly, that it's something that we need to face. And there's a way in which we can, you know, that we can, deal with what we're experiencing. You know, I, I think a lot about eagles because eagles are the only bird that fly directly through the storm. <laughs> All others go around. But eagles in particular, they fly directly through the storm. And I think about storytellers that way, you know, storytellers are some of the bravest, wildest. I mean, we're professional gamblers. We're <laughs> outlaws. You know, I, I think that storytellers have a way of really, of really breaking through and, and creating something, you know, for our, for, our culture, for our cultures and for our society. And now is a time in which things are really changing. As far as indigenous representation, native representation, which is, a, you know, as you were saying, Kiki, it's a deplorable absence. You know, we're systemically erased from, you know, from the, the nation's story. And at the same time, I've, I've seen things really begin to change in a post, what I would call a post standing rock world, um, where somehow that uprising, that movement awakened people to the idea that the original people are still here. And that these are the people that are actually fighting for the land and fighting for the water for everyone. And so that was a moment that was really in many ways a threshold moment um, for people to, to, to sort of remember you know, that the people are here. And 
I don't know why it's the way it is in the United States because it's different in Canada. There isn't the same kind of erasure within entertainment and media and education and policy and pop culture and literature. The erasure is so prominent in the United States, but it's not quite the same within the Canadian system, although I could still consider Canada to be a very racist country. Um, but it, it is different in this country. And I, I work with an organization called Illuminated, which I certainly encourage people to follow. And the, the, the organization is founded in research and data. And from our research, we've learned that Native people make up one-tenth of 1% 1 of representation in American film and television. It's what I call an extermination by narrative. And I don't think that that erasure is serving us as a country. I feel that there's something, you know, we all should be in the story. And there's not, there, there is a collective authenticity to who this country is. And I feel that we all have a responsibility and we will all benefit from seeking out, working to find this collective authenticity and for everyone to have a seat at the table of the national narrative. So it's something that I've spent a lifetime working toward um, and, and incidentally, it's just in this, I mean, literally perhaps in the last 12 months that it's really began to change, which is really exciting. So thank you. Yes, and you know, um, it is interesting, you know, uh, the change this year as everyone, I was talking to someone um, just before I got onto this Zoom call, we were talking about UFOs and talking about how crazy 2020 was, that the US government admitted that there has been UFO activity in our airspace and it barely made the front page. And I think that is an effect of so much change happening at the same time, which it, sometimes it can feel traumatic, you know, great change in a short period of time. And 2020 has definitely been that way. And so what I wanted to ask um, all of you, and anyone can jump in, this year as jury members, and I'll kick it off with Paul, because Paul, you know, you, you're original OG. <laughs> How have you seen, from a jury perspective, because this is what, your second time on the jury, how have you seen filmmakers, now these films were submitted prior to the pandemic, but like she said, the shift was happening, you know, it's been happening over the last year, and, and there's been a lot of change. Have you seen a trend that's been different this year from a jury perspective, dealing with the stories that we're seeing as opposed to, like you said, you know, eight years ago, five years ago as a jury member? And then also because you have such an amazing career as an actor and you span TV, film, I mean, you, you really do it all. Do you see a shift from the actor's point of view and the material that you're being sent and the stories that are being addressed? Or is it too soon to see it maybe on that end? I think covering the, uh, the last question, I think it's a little bit too soon right now to answer that last question because, you know, many times promises are made and things are said, there's gonna be a change and I like to call it out blah, 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 uh, because I've been there before. Mm -hmm. uh, and it all depends on what the people do, whether the changes are going to occur as to whether the changes are going to stay. And I'm talking about the people in general and filmmakers as well. Um, you never know how it's gonna turn out. You know, um, Like I said, I've been there through a lot of different changes. Um, I'm old enough to have lived through the uh, 60s uh, with Martin Luther King and Kennedy and Malcolm X, both Kennedys and putting a man on the moon and Kent State riots with students getting shot death, Vietnam War, so, and, and Nixon. Um, so I lived through that. Uh, the heroin epidemic where I think 99% of my friends became heroin addicts, you know, growing up in New York City. Um, so I compare this time to that time. Uh, during that time, it led to those amazing films of the 70s. Like every other film is just a masterpiece. Uh, just, and those films dealt with so much uh, political and social uh, change that, you know, you can look back at all those films. I think every other film was just, again, I repeat, a masterpiece. So now we need to have that same 
drive, that same kind of vision where we're going to make a change through the art. Because I think in the final analysis, art is the only escape, art is the only change because it can, it can go out to so many uh, people all over the world. You know, you can make political statements and this and that, but if you make a film of substance, if you make a film that really challenges people's perspectives on anything, it's going to make a change because it's gonna be there for a long, 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 long time. So uh, my hope and trust is that this period of time in which we're living in will be the catalyst for that, for an enormous outpouring of films. Uh, you know, I've been doing that with a theater company of which I'm the uh, co-founder of, and that's all we've been doing is creating work that is challenging, not only to uh, the audience, but also to ourselves. First, to ourselves. We can challenge ourselves, then we're going to challenge the audience. So, and not to be pretty about it, not to, you know, uh, dart around the edges, but to fully, like Heather was saying, like an eagle, you know, I'll fly right through the storm of creativity and hopefully make a change, a great change for the better. Right. Um, you know, I guess one silver lining of the pandemic is I got to catch up on all of the things that I could have seen in the last few years that I didn't have time. And so Robin, I binge watched over the weekend, uh, not this weekend, but during the pandemic, uh, in a 48 hour period, both season one and season two of Big Little Lies which you were so fantastic. I was wondering if you were taking any patience. No, I'm just teasing. Um, but that was also, you know, because I remember hearing about, everybody was talking about that. And you've, you've, you have, a, like Paul, an extraordinary career. You've been in some amazing, you know, really what you would call water cooler chat type where everyone's talking about it on Monday morning with each other. Um, but that was a, a bit of a beginning of a systematic change in the sense that there were so many women involved in that, that project. From a producing point, it was a story about women, it was a friendship. Um, if you'd like to just expand upon that, and, and again, like I asked Paul, how you see things right now and, and maybe going forward. Okay, yeah. I, I, um... I feel like we're in a moment where the art form is a little submerged. Um, the art form that is acting is a little submerged because I think we're interested in who actors are and, the, and what acting is in its essence is, is a kind of miraculous thing that's about transformation. Um, and we're in a time where it's very important to people to know who an actor actually is in that actor's real life and social media supports that. and. Um, so we're in a moment where the art form to me feels a bit suppressed. Um, uh, I, and, I, and I believe deeply in the art form. So I, I, I'm looking forward to kind of a renaissance, but I feel hopeful in this moment because there is a kind of authenticity, a kind of forced authenticity, because this has not been a very authentic culture for a very long time, but because we're all in isolation and we're all dealing with people intimate to us uh, uh, more of the time. Um, um, I know for myself personally, there's a kind of, it's a, a, like a truth serum effect where um, stuff that feels like BS re really strongly grates on me right now. You know, um, I, I want people to be telling each other the truth. And I think that's a, and I, and I see that in, in like-minded friends everywhere, um, that we want to be saying true things to each other in true ways. And uh, all that jockeying for power and position and all that stuff that kind of makes Hollywood click feels, uh, feels like it's, it's dominating a little less because it can't, because there, you know, there's a paucity of work. And instead, people are sort of finding each other in truer, simpler ways. And I think it's out of that that art will have its renaissance again, because it, because it always starts with um, a, a, a kind of touching base with what is authentic, um, both in oneself and in the people that, that we know, you know? So um, although it feels like dark times, 
uh, it's important to remember, it's very important to remember uh, what happened in Germany because, uh, you know, Germany is beautifully progressive now. Um, and, you know, there was a Hitler. So it, it, what happens is if something gets, if, if, if times get dark enough, um, there, there is a forced reckoning. And, uh, and I think we're in such a period right now, times are just dark enough that there is a forced reckoning. Um, and, uh, and I mean, there's really only two ways from here. The country, either democracy as a, as a concept dies or we, we, you know, sort of come out of the ashes and we, and, and, and we rebuild and the arts are absolutely going to be part of that. Now, I know I'm not talking about um, women, you know, uh, getting together and, and, and getting more powerful and, and all of that because it's, it, it, it's of interest to me, but it's not as much a, of interest to me as this bigger picture uh, authenticity question, um, which is across the board and every demographic and every um, majority or minority population needs to key into the truth. Um, and, uh, you know, disenfranchised and enfranchised alike, you know, there, there is a, there is a, a call to be real with one another. And, uh, you know, I, uh, the, the, I'm going to shut up in a second, but the best, the best thing that came for me out of this time was an, an urgency to connect with, um, you know, my fellows. So I put a call out to a bunch of people who had been in an actors writers collective handful of years ago that, that disbanded naturally because everybody got employed um, and busy uh, and said, who wants to get back together? And now we have a sort of thing every Sunday where we meet and we share work and it's become incredibly meaningful to me. Like, uh, and, and the bar keeps going up in terms of how uh, willing to disclose and willing to you know, be in the real people are with one another in this group. So I, I see that as hopeful and all kinds of little signs. It's like watching new growth out of, out of scorched earth, you know, which is what California is going to need too, to, to come back. Um, so that's, uh, that's, my, that's my sort of avoiding answer of your question, but, but it's, it's my deepest answer, I guess. <laughs> that's fair. Um, <laughs> You know, I, this is panel is about, you know, I will ask you questions and I, I like authenticity <laughs> and I like truthfulness. And, um, you know, we are, I think, at a crossroads here. And I do believe that there is a yearning for people to do and artists to produce and execute and turn out work that has meaning. Um, and I mean stories that have meaning, stories that are cohesive, stories that resonate with us beyond um, the Avengers, even though the Avengers have its place. Um, and so, you know, we were talking about for the audience that just, you know, are watching this as we started prior to that, we were talking amongst ourselves before we went live. And Taryn was actually talking about how she's been working She's been on set. She couldn't attend one meeting that the jury had. And so what I'd like to ask you, since you're, you're kind of in the throes of everything and we're talking about filmmaking and we're talking about the future of filmmaking and storytelling with social injustice, how does the set feel different? How does going back to work kind of still in this time right now, uh, how are things? That's a great question. Thank you so much. And thank you to Sonia and uh, to, to Ingrid. I love you guys. Thank you guys so much. And so appreciate all these candid answers. Uh, man, it's always been my rule never to talk about politics and religion. It gets me in a lot of trouble. So thank you for this very direct question. I'm going to talk to you guys about set and what that's been like so you have to get a covid test right upon you know right upon uh going to set now and basically everybody on set wears a mask but the actors don't have to <laughs> you know it's like okay but everybody on this set um has a has a confirmed 
a negative test that came, you can go to these drive through, uh, get your mouth swabbed and then you go to the, the set. And um, it's very different, you guys. It's very, very different. There is, um, you remember how there was a time in this, I speak to my other fellow actors who are, you know, we're on set and it's so hard because a lot of Hollywood, well, a lot of politicians and people that don't understand our line of work, we're like the first to go in their eyes. Like, let's get rid of these dumbass actors, excuse my language, basically think that we're just like globules that have nothing to say or do better that we're just puppets. But it turns out that a lot of these globules, if you will, actually have a brain and make films and and are moving mountains. Just because you're an actor doesn't mean you're not a producer, a director, a writer. We have many facets to us. So just to extinguish us right away it would be a crime because then we wouldn't have entertainment. And I believe that everybody loves entertainment, whether you're into pornography, film, you know, theater, music. We all love entertainment. So anyway, going back to set, um, it's very different and it's a very uh, pared down set. You know, we need a lot of grips, lighting, sound, hair and makeup. It takes a village to make a movie. But it turns out you can make one too with only four people and an actor. <laughs> so I just want to bring us back to like, you two can make your dream come true with a, a small crew and and, and a big vision and a great camera and some great lighting and obviously post-production. Um, I leave for a film in a couple of days. I have to do a COVID test before I take off and upon landing. So literally before I take off and then upon landing, it kind of takes the fun out of things. I've been quarantined this whole seven months. Um, I've come back negative every time, which I'm proud to say but doesn't mean that another fine day, it might come back positive, but it makes you just wonder if it's all worth it. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna sit here and sugarcoat everything. Like I've been like, well, I am, you know, I am loving my gardening these days and I'm loving, and I could choke up you guys, cause my whole life was, I was born to do this. You know, I'm a trained dancer, actor, singer, musician. Like this is, this is tragic. This is tragic. It's very tragic. Um, I think what's interesting, what you touched upon is the light crews and, you yeah, know, telling yeah, a film yeah. with four people and yeah, maybe yeah. And you can Hollywood getting away from these monster, monster yeah. films. These sequels with, and prequels and yeah. Keep, and touching keep, on what Robin was talking about, stories that have meaning that are true. Right. And Heather too. Yep, and Heather. Absolutely. And, and, and Paul, come on little stories that mean so much, you know, just right. keep, yeah, have a pared down set. But don't forget that your movie matters. Look at Chelsea Film Festival, taking submissions. There's the dream still there, it's alive. You know, you can't replace an actor in a dream ever, no matter what's going on with politics. Or uh, let's talk about the environment, what have you. We could go on and on, you know? But and I think love, okay. Yeah, piggybacking, you know, off of what you said and talking about, you know, stories with meaning and light crews, there is this, um, you know, and Chelsea Film Festival has always been great about giving platforms to those movies, you know, the movies that might not get wide distribution or get to be on Netflix or the streamings or HBO or even or may or maybe they end up there. Right. Never, like we're in that time little... where there is a shift. Yeah. And like the gatekeepers and small. So, and you know, as we segue in that, I wanted to talk to you, um, Ellie, about, you know, your work on, on Orthodox. You, you know, with that, you're bringing in an ethnicity and a community that, you know, for someone like myself, I didn't knew, know too much about. I only knew kind of the surface level. And with that show, I, you know, authenticity was a huge integral part it was so specific, it it became like what many people, at least in my opinion, it's so specific, it becomes universal. And so as you're in New York, and um, would you just like to talk a little bit about that, your experience with that project and going forward and how you see things um, from your particular 
niche of what you do. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much, all of you, for having me. It's an honor to be here. It's a pleasure to be here, Sonia, Ingrid, um, and the whole festival. Um, it's been it's been an incredible ride. Um, it's it's really wonderful to kind of be included um, in every aspect of the art and every aspect of 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 the artistic community. Um, and um, I've really been listening with a lot of interest to everything all of you have been saying, and so much of it has struck a chord, um, especially with respect to authenticity and, and representation. Um, uh, for me, I, I kind of have a little bit of an outsider's perspective on that, because even though I was born and bred in Brooklyn, um, I grew up in a community that may as well have been in another country or in another century, frankly. Um, and my only entree into the world around me was through this very art form. Um, we officially did not have a television in the house as virtually all members of my community um, don't, but we had a really old TV locked away in the basement that um, we got from my grandmother who had Alzheimer's. And then after she passed away, they just locked it in the basement. So being a healthy pubescent boy, I would sneak in every night into the basement after my parents fell asleep. I would just watch late night reruns and syndicated, syndicated sitcoms and whatever kind of TV edited movies were running on late night ABC. And I thought that I was learning so much about the world around me and different cultures, especially minority cultures, especially Native Americans. Um, it, it, I, I don't know how many old Westerns I watched and thought, wow, this is what they were like, or this is what you know the old West was like, or this is how the West was won. Um, I can go on and on, whether it was um, um, the civil rights movement or, or really any culture or, or historical period that I, I had, if I had any insight into it, it was incredibly biased and incredibly watered down through the prism of, of you know, American um, education, Western education, um, Orthodox Hasidic Jewish education, what have you. Um, and, and all this kind of came to a crash uh, when I was about 14 or 15. And I saw a movie about Hasidim for the first time. And it was so bad and it was so wrong that it just, it just kind of threw me for a loop. Um, after I recovered from the initial shock of that, I started wondering, is, is anything I saw true? Is anything I learned about the world around me true? Um, and I, I kind of carried that with me until, until last year when I was asked to be a consultant for a show called Unorthodox. Um, and um, there are so many children out there like me that are growing up with really bad information. And, and, and the tragedy is that um, un Unorthodox has shown me personally how important and how powerful an authentic and representative um, film can be and the impact that can have. I mean, we've been receiving messages from all over the world about how the show has touched people's lives. Um, I read a tweet written in Turkish that said, this is the first time I cried about somebody Jewish. Oh, that's amazing. Um, I get tweets from, from people um, in Islamic countries all over the world telling me how much they identify with the show and how much they relate to it and how similar our communities are. Um, and it's ironic because my, my, my parents are both children of Holocaust survivors. All four of my grandparents survived the Holocaust. They lost their entire families. Um, my mother's parents met and married in a displaced persons camp after having lost 
their respective spouses and children at Auschwitz. Um, so you would think they would be um, more open to understanding other people's cultures and other people's histories and other people's backgrounds and their oppressions and their struggles. But um, the, the, the insulation that many people create around themselves creates this sense of, of exceptionalism and our history is different or our struggle is different and it, it really blocks you from seeing other people's struggle and understanding other people's struggles. Um, but if we can tell these stories uh, through film, through television, which, which, which is really the most powerful medium through which to tell these stories, um, th there is no much telling, there, there is no telling how much change and how much impact um, that can have on, on people's lives as far as understanding other people, bringing people together. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's incredible. So the, the, the fact that until now, um, the art form uh, was so woefully um, underrepresented and um, inauthentic is, 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 is criminal. Um, but the good news is that I'm absolutely seeing a change. I mean, uh, the fact that a show like Unorthodox was made, um, the fact that um, since then I've been getting um, inquiries that I never would have gotten before, where people are suddenly sensitive about culture and language and representation, and they want to do it right, and they want to get it right, and they want to spend money to make sure that they get it right. Um, I, I can only speak to the Yiddish side of that, but I'm sure there's a corresponding change uh, for, for, you know, other ethnicities and other minorities. So um, it's, it, it's wonderful to see that happening and it cannot come soon enough. Yeah, I think, you know, these seeds, you know, there was kind of, a, in the last four years in particular, I think in the United States, and then I think um, there is this hunger for truthful stories and by getting them so authentic and by getting them specific, you're bringing people into these worlds. Um, like the person that said, you know, this was, you know, was it um, the first time they cried over a Jewish person? And that empathy that storytellers can bring to the table is immense. And I do think that this time going forward, you do sense that people are reconnecting, like Robin with her group, you know, this need to create content that goes beyond our storytelling. And Paul, you touched on it, you know, it's really true not to make this an academic session about filmmaking, but you know, the 70s did open up this kind of counterculture, the late 60s, all the protests to some fantastic filmmaking. It was a new wave filmmakers, particularly in America. And as we're looking, and we're, I wanna shift this a little bit back to the Chelsea Film Festival is, I asked this question earlier, but did you as jury members, did you kind of feel this year, do you see some of the films that were responding to this maybe earlier that weren't triggered by the pandemic, but were kind of triggered by these shifts, you know, worldwide, domestic, where people are going towards stories that have a meaning beyond, you know, they're entertaining, but they also adjust these deeper levels of authenticity and truthfulness. Anyone want to address what they, any shifts that they saw, any changes this year? Even Ingrid, I mean, Sonia, you, you screened these films. Did you get a sense that the filmmakers were absorbing what we have felt so strongly this year? Yeah, I mean, I can respond to that. I actually saw a lot of films, um, the 130 films this year. So the work, um, a lot of the work actually has been submitted during the pandemic. So some work has been shot during the pandemic. 
Um, and as Taryn said, the, um, the crew has been drastically uh, changed and, and reduced. So a lot of the films that we've seen in like the short content um, is very short, like five minutes, three minutes, very, um, very deep as well. The stories are very, very deep. Um, not that they were not deep before, but uh, we have actually a couple of films like strictly dealing with pandemic, the pandemic. So, and some of the films, I don't wanna just um, you know, highlight too many names, but we have a film that's called P Pandemic Zoom, actually. <laughs> <At the festival. laughs> so uh, yeah, so uh, the, the, the work is different. I feel, you know, you talked about a lot about authenticity and uh, yeah, that, that's what this, um, this time is all about, you know, reconnecting to ourselves, being truthful and present and grounded and yeah, but thank you. Well, I think we are, are we at the time to now take questions from the audience out there? Yes, we have a few questions actually. Um, mm -hmm. We have a few questions and okay. So how do you think the pandemic will change the industry in the long term? <laughs> Taryn. Me? Oh, wow. Um, I think that it's a known thing that everything's becoming streaming, which I'm, it's obviously very convenient, but what that, what that hurts my per personal heart about is it's less, less, um, you know, going to the movies as a family and, you know, the, it's just in a way more to me, to be honest, uh, isolation I love that you can stream because it is very expensive to take your family to the movies in this day and age um but yeah things are you know I'm not sure I I, have, I can't lie I, I feel feel nervous every day and a little fearful but I try not to let the fear take over because I do know that people love to be entertained and that and that'll never stop I mean that's from the beginning of time if you had a funny you know, a circus or a gesture. I mean, we, but the problem is, is, but only a solution is not, not every movie has to be so negative. I feel like a little more comedy and a little more laughter, but the, the only thing is people don't really take to that as much as they do the crisis. So my hopes is that we could bring back more comedy and slapstick comedy and just, you know, have a good time again and and, and lighten up some of these loads, make a joke out of some of it, because God says to remain childlike, not child, not, not, not childish. So I still believe in, in a childlike nature that we take from the moment we're here to the moment we pass. And I would like to see more movies done in a very child, childlike manner where there's, there's loving smiles and goofiness and we're all having a blast because making movies is not brain science right it, what a blessing it is to make a movie and just like heather said the filming is only one portion of the journey i mean literally you gotta raise the money make the movie and then everybody always forgets about post-production mind you that's where the sound design comes in the 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 music and all the songs that we all love to hear so as a filmmaker just remember that don't blow your load at the top and make sure that you've really budgeted yourself well from pre, during, and post. And just, you know, and make sure you can fly your actors out because you want them to come out and be able to speak on their films. You know, you want the faces behind the film. Maybe they even have their own place to put themselves up in a hotel, or maybe their friend will put them up. So just remember, you want your actors there. You want your actors there representing you because that's where the heart is the hearts at the home the hearts of the if you have actors they put their hearts into their movies that's all i have to say let me yeah, pick I, up ball for something. I i think i think uh that there's been a tremendous appetite for cruelty in the culture and i think it's Thank reflected, reflected in our politics and um 
you know, there, that there's a, a period before we shut down, you know, hoping to score a job with a good paycheck and all of that, where <laughs> feeling like it, like there was something deeply immoral about, about my uh, profession. Um, because it, because it just felt like you were meant to stand up and, and almost like not be a human being anymore, but be a kind of a, 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 a thing, like a thing, um, you know, in so many of these venues, like you'd, you'd sign on to play a character and you would give it a three dimensionality as best you could, and, you know, invest in your character. And the next thing you know, you know, she'd have her head spiked on the glass table or whatever, you know, I don't mean to set you. Like a product, being <laughs> objectified. But, you know, and, and, and suddenly it's like, oh, you know, um, and, and almost like as a sight gag or as a thing, it, it, it's, it's very, very uh, tough um, on an actor, I guess I would just say an actor like me, um, you know, who, who holds th this uh, profession in some kind of a, a sacred place. I, I, uh, I, I think that um, the art form of acting has a great deal to do with inculcating compassion in, in, in humans. You know, um, there's, there's different virtues to every aspect of the, uh, you know, uh, um, and, 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 you know, like so, so, so gorgeously in your piece, that actress was just a miracle, but like the, the capacity of an actor, like say a Phil Hoffman or the actor, the actress that I so deeply admire to expose themselves totally so that people can enter the human condition through them. I mean, if their own lives are kind of shut down, can remember what it is to be a human being through an actor, you know, and, uh, and that has been largely lost in favor of, uh, having actors be these sort of gladiators that are up there being like these emotional gladiators. You, you take a punch and you keep on going and you embody some weird, distorted, cruel version of the American dream, which is like, I can take any amount of licks and I'm just gonna you know, hit you back and I'm gonna hit you harder. And I'm, I'm a kick-ass woman because I can kick your ass harder than some kick-ass man. And that's what feminism is, which to me is like, what? That's not feminism, guys. That's like something else, you know? Um, if you can be, if you can kick ass harder than some man kicking ass, it's, it's not interesting, you know. Um, compassion is interesting, and humanity is interesting. And uh, my hope—I'm not saying it's my expectation, but my hope—in success, uh, if this pandemic does does its work, is we come back with a more humane art form again, um, and people having an appetite for that again, and get out of this video game mentality, you know, like let's blow shit up and excuse my. But like, you know, this is the garbage. Um, and that's what is, has dominated the culture for a long, long time now. So, so maybe we're waking up or maybe we're not. We'll, we'll see. Thank you, Taryn and Robin. We have another question. How um, do you think, well, actually I read that question, I'm sorry. Um, is there any point in your life and career that has actually helped you through this pandemic, this that you've been in for a long time now? Is there anything that had made you resilient and that you can use during this time or that you have been using? I think I'm gonna just talk again until somebody takes over. <laughs> I think I can look friend by friend by friend by friend and see, uh, you know, the results of different choices on people's psyches right now, life choices on people's psyches right now. Um, it's um, oh, the whole range from people who want to kill themselves, who I try to talk to as often as possible, to people who have discovered themselves and are completely galvanized in a, in a, in a positive way. Um, and it's the whole gamut. And, um, you know, it's just a lot of people discovering what was working before doesn't anymore. And a lot of people discovering, oh, oh, this is who I actually am. You know, I actually am this, this person. Um, and uh, so, I mean, there's great peril, but there's also great hope in what this is doing to people. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. Hey, Ingrid, can you repeat the question? Yes, of course. So uh, is there any point uh, in your life or career that has helped you through the pandemic? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, first six years, it was all a struggle, uh, huge struggle. 
personally, emotionally, mentally, physically, and and to be honest, I'd rather be here than there. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say that um, it's interesting. I mean, I, I I was in the corporate world until about four years ago when I decided to start acting, and um, um, and I've kind of embraced this this life of uncertainty f for the sake of um, better relating to my own humanity, better relating to other people's humanity, not being caught up in this in this cold, um, um, impassive corporate world. Um, so I, I, I feel like in some respect that's prepared me for this and, and the art, of course. Um, it always comes back to the art. I mean, uh, if, if anything has proven to us that, that art is not a luxury um, and that art is essential to human survival, it is this period that we're all going through right now where everybody's been retaining their sanity only by virtue of having this luxury of art and content that they can binge on demand at any given time that um, just continues to inspire us. I mean, for me, it's been, um, I've, I've been, I've been binge watching classical concerts and opera almost nonstop since the start of the pandemic. And that's the one thing that keeps me sane um, and that keeps me inspired. And uh, because uh, you, you watch some, some of our greatest artistic creations as human beings and all you kind of come away with is this feeling that the human spirit is so strong and so powerful uh, that it was able to create this. And so it must survive, it must go on. And, and I, you know, that's, I, I guess that's what keeps me going. And it, it's, it's, it's the art and I, you know, we're lucky that we're, we're in a position where we're able to create art and we were able to to create meaning in our in our own lives. Um, not everybody's as fortunate. Um, at the same time, like just like everybody's saying, um, the industry is at a standstill, and um, we're rightfully not deemed essential, even though we kind of are. But we're also not. There are other far more essential industries than us, and so. But that gives us time to create more art and to kind of return to our roots and, and write and, and collaborate and do all the things you do before the art is actually produced, before the film is actually produced. Um, but hopefully we can go on um, um, doing the actual production work very soon. I would add, um, and I appreciate everything that everyone has said so much it's hard to top anything because this is a very special group um but i would add that you know if there's anything that prepared me for these times um is that i, I just grew up with very humble beginnings i grew up in central mountain idaho and for many years did not have running water or electricity and just lived a life that was very close to the earth and had a kind of simplicity to it that was that was you know essential. So I will say that I there's a part of me that always lives with like I can always go to the mountains and I'm going to be okay, you know. Um, so I don't live with a lot of fear, you know. Um, it's not something that just is generally that I that I that I live with, but I understand it, and you know I live a comfortable life now. I have plumbing. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I feel like that I, I have a base that gave me a sense of that no matter what happens, you know, you know I, I know I'm going to be okay. And I think it's, there's something about artists that, you know, artists tend to live with that kind of, you know, I mean, you hope that as an artist, you, you, there's always a kind of optimism, even if it's pathological optimism. <laughs> I think that artists do live with a kind of optimism that you just know that you're going to get through it, you know, and if you come from a family system or a cultural group or a history or whatever it may be where you've had to endure a lot, then you come with a knowingness that you're going to be able to get through. You know, all of us, our ancestors were incredibly resilient, all of us. And, and I think that, you know, I resonate, um, I, I reflect on that resilience 
a lot and think about, you know, that we're in the best of times at the same time that we're in the worst of times. Um, and, and I'm, you know, like, like, you know, all of you said in some way or another, I mean, art is our freedom, you know, if that's what speaks to your spirit. It's, it's our way in which we can liberate ourselves. So I think that these times have been really interesting as artists because it's been a time in which we could develop so much. I've had more conversations in the last six months and, and spent more time, you know, thinking about and talking about and working on story at the midst, you know, in the midst of all of it. And I've also been, you know, had the good fortune of spending a lot of time like this in these conversations and working with young people and emerging artists and, you know, mentoring. And I have to say that has given me so much hope and so much inspiration because it's, I've had an, the opportunity to be with those artists and those voices who are the next generation, you know, and, and to invest my time in them. And it's been really valuable. It's been a wonderful night. And it was my honor to talk with each of you. And so I thank you. And I thank you on behalf of Chelsea Film Festival and looking forward to this weekend to view some Great. films Thanks, yeah. and Good. celebrate the filmmakers. <laughs> thank you all again so much. Thank you, Kiki, for um, moderating this great conversation. <laughs> so have a fantastic <laughs> festival. I hope you watch um, some other films, some short films that we have also the, that we're presenting this year in documentaries. Uh, and I'll see you again soon. Thank <music> you.